Welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, the birthplace of congregational humanism. We carry on that tradition of free thought today, dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. Our web address is firstunitarian.org. I'm David Breeden, Senior Minister. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly assembly for Sunday, October 17th, 2021. We welcome you to our online assembly. Whether this is one of your first visits or you've been with us many times, we are glad that you are here as a part of our gathered community. After assembly today, please join our Zoom coffee hour. It's always great to check in and see each other's faces. And the link for coffee hour will be in the chat. Even though assembly is an online event, we are adding in-person outdoor opportunities to get together this month, such as hiking and walking outings, a chili cook-off and pumpkin carving. The Friday email has details of this. Our theme this month is cultivating relationships. And these are the words of Adrian Marie Brown from her book, Emergent Strategy. We are socialized to see what is wrong, missing, off, to tear down the ideas of others and up uplift our own. To a certain degree, our entire future may depend on learning to listen, listen without assumptions or defenses. Come. Let us gather in community. This morning are the second aspiration of First Unitarian Society. We aspire to pursue wisdom through reason, science, art, and the stories of civilizations. And if you will join me from home in our congregational covenant. Love is the spirit of this place and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Good morning. I'm Allison Wyatt, Director of Religious Education for First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. This morning, I'm bringing you our Time for All Ages story. So let's give our young ones a minute to gather around and get comfortable so we can all hear this fantastic tale. You might have heard people ask the question before, what is art? It's a little hard to pin down sometimes. sometimes Spray paint on a wall is a celebrated piece by Banksy, and other times it's just plain old graffiti. You may also have heard a pretty famous answer to the question, what is art? Which is, I know it when I see it. Our story today suggests pretty sweetly that we might see art in unexpected places if we know just what to look for. So let's hear Grandma in Blue with Red Hat by Scott Menchin. Saturday is the best day because that's the day I go to art class at the museum. I've been coming here forever. Have a great day. See you at home, Grandma. Ms. Montebello is the art teacher. She knows everything about art. Did you know that anything can be in an art exhibition? Toys, hair clips, guitars, water bottles, anything. It's brilliant and beautifully crafted. Ms. Montebello calls us her little Picassos. 
Picasso was a famous artist. He liked to paint in his underwear. Pablo, put some clothes on. The Guggenheims are on their way over. I wonder if underwear could be in an art exhibition. Miss, no photos. Can any of you little Picassos tell me why you think this is in the museum? That's the question Ms. Montebello always asks us when we look at art. Alice says, because it's beautiful. Sasha says, because it's different. Henry says, because it tells a story. Thomas says, because it came from somewhere far away. Jack says, because it makes me feel good. Alex says, because it's funny. Karina says, because there's only one like it in the whole world. Ms. Montebello says there are no wrong answers when it comes to art, and she explains that most of the artwork was given to the museum. Maybe someday I could give some artwork to the museum. Grandma's waiting for me at home. What did you do in class today? I tell her and I realize that grandma is beautiful. Grandma is different. Grandma is funny. Grandma tells me stories. Grandma comes from far away. Grandma makes me feel good. There is only one of her in the entire world. I should give grandma to the museum. The next week, I tell Ms. Montebello about my idea, and she tells me I should ask the curator of the museum. Your grandma sounds like an exceptional grandma, but as much as I would love to accept your gift, we do have a rule at the museum, we do not take grandmas. And that's when I have a great idea. Mom and dad and grandma helped me get ready for the big day. A little to the right, no, too much. Just tilted a teensy bit to the left. My friends are there, grandma's friends are there, mom and dad's friends are there, and Ms. Montebello and the curator are there. Welcome to my exhibition, everyone. These cupcakes are delicious. This one's beautiful. This one's different. This one tells a story. This one's funny. This one makes me feel good. I especially like this one. What do you call it? Grandma in blue with red hat. What a wonderful exhibition. It's one of a kind, just like grandma. Our friend, little Picasso, is making a pretty bold claim here. He's suggesting that in many ways, we are the art, how we treat each other, how we live our lives, how we hold each other up, how we value one another. That's how we elevate our own lives into art. So this week, I hope you'll look carefully at those around you and look for the ways they are showing you how to make a life with a beauty worth hanging in a museum. I lost myself on a cool, damp night Gave myself to that misty light Was hypnotized by strange delight Under the lilac tree I made wine from the lilac tree Put my heart in its recipe Makes me see what I want to see And be what I want to be I think more than I want to think I do things I never should do I drink much more than I ought to drink Because it brings me back you 
Y'all know that I'm a Texan, and any Texan will tell you that chili includes beef and no beans. We can be a little aggressive on the point. But now I live in Minnesota, Minneapolis, no less, where I make vegan chili with beans. Go figure. Well, whatever your taste preference or your recipe, get ready for the FUS Chili Cook-Off. It's gonna be on Sunday, October 24th from noon to 2 p.m. in person. We're gonna to be together on our patio outside the lower assembly hall. Oh, it'll be so good to see each other and share a meal together. Now, if you wanna to volunteer to help or register your pot of chili to enter the cook-off, be sure and let Rev Jim know. And everybody, come hungry. Since our founding in 1881, members and friends' support of First Unitarian Society has been essential for our ongoing mission. Our Sunday assemblies, community celebrations, cultural enrichment, and work in social justice come to you with the hard work of our dedicated staff and volunteers. Your contributions will help assure the continuing work of First Unitarian Society. Give now at PayPal the Give Plus app, or firstunitarian.org slash donate. Thank you. On Sundays when we gather, we take a few minutes to reflect on the joys, sorrows, and milestones of the human experience. We do this so that we stay in touch with our own humanity. We do this to remind ourselves of the value of a moment of stillness, and we do this so that no one among us is alone, either in celebrating joy or in facing the burdens of life. This morning, we're gonna simply take a moment of silence to reflect on all the challenges and heartbreak going on in our lives and in our world, and we'll pause to name that these are difficult times for all kinds of people, and we remind ourselves to be gentle with ourselves and others. And we think with gratitude of all those who are taking on the big and small challenges of life and who are leading lives of justice, service, and compassion. Let us now take a moment of silence.
Today and tomorrow, all around the globe, faith communities are coming together in a public stance for climate justice to sing, pray, and share dreams for a livable world for all. In the lead up to the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which begins on October 31st in Glasgow, Scotland, this global action calls us to make our voices heard because Merely holding the right opinion is not enough. First Unitarian Society is proud to join this action. Our humanist values call us to live ethically in loving, reverent relationship with nature and to make the changes we need for a just world, a commitment that includes sustainability for all. Tomorrow at noon at the Federal Building in Minneapolis, members of the FUS Climate Justice Team will join with hundreds of people of faith from all over our state, along with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light for a rally and march. I will offer a humanist statement at the gathering and Marcy Lessler will be carrying our banner, the one that Catherine Jordan and I painted this week. We hope that you can join us as we work for the present and the future.
It is with great pleasure that I introduce J.F. Martell to you this morning. Uh, J.F. Martell is an author, podcaster, screenwriter, and film and TV director from Ottawa, Canada. His screen work includes French and English language docu documentary series and features focused on culture and the arts. He is the author of Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice, a book about the nature and power of art. And those of you who were with us well, about three or four weeks ago, I used that book uh, in my talk because it is a brilliant, brilliant way of looking at art and I definitely highly recommend it to you. J.F.'s writings on culture and art and philosophy, and I should underline philosophy, he's a, a brilliant philosopher, I think, have appeared in Reality Sandwich, Meta Psychosis, The Finch, Disinfo, and other magazines. It is great to introduce to you J.F. Martell. Hello, J.F., welcome. Hi, I'm so, I'm so, so glad, glad to be here. here. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me. me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, so you, uh, one of your big projects right now is the Weird Studies podcast that you do with your co-host, Phil Ford. Um, and on a little blurb uh, on the internet that describes it, it's, you say, the weird is that which resists any settled explanation or frame of reference. Um, you talk mostly about art on that podcast, but you have a very specific way of approaching it. And um, I'm curious what... What, what is that project to you guys, and, and um, what, you know, what uh, inspired you to do it, you and Phil? Uh, well, Phil Ford is uh, he's a musicologist from uh, the, in the, in the University of Indiana in Bloomington. And uh, he and I uh, began a correspondence. Um, it started around my book. He did an event with me here in Ottawa uh, in 2015. And then we started to write emails to one another, long, long emails, like 16,000 word emails. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually it kind of evolved into the podcast. So we just wanted to kind of take our conversations online so that we could, you know, share um, some of our discoveries with others because we found that when we talked, we both kind of uh, learn things, uh, not just from one another, but we kind of just discovered things, you know, found things. Um, and, uh, and so Weird Studies is all about trying to do that in, the, in a podcast form, trying to searching for things. And so the weird to us is, uh, is a word we use to, um, to point to that radical mystery that um, is kind of the the default mode of human existence, right? It, that we tend to cover up and forget about as we get um, caught up in the 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 business of of of, of living. Um, but we like to remind ourselves of that mystery, and and to us, art is the prime engine for leading us back to that radical mystery. And uh, that seems to be that's the thesis of reclaiming art was that this is precisely what art can do that um, other modes of inquiry um, or, or uh, yeah, have, a, have trouble doing or don't do in the same direct and radical way, let's say. And uh, some people may not know, I, in my other life, I was an old English professor. And so weird is right out of old English. We're talking the beginnings of the English language. Uh, it used to be spelled W-Y-R-D. But in those days, that meant fate. And so if something like, you know, someone falls over dead, you say, that's weird, because fate has <laughs> intervened right in into uh, the historical moment. And it, it's weird that weird has remained all the way through the English language, and we still say, wow, that's weird. And yeah. now you study it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating word. Um, Eric Davis, uh, he, he's, a, he's a brilliant writer on, on matters of... Um, uh, technology, myth, religion. Um, he wrote a wonderful uh, essay about the etymology of the word weird. And it's very, very strange and interesting to track how the word has evolved through time. It used to mean fate, as you say, 
uh, a kind of uh, uh, destiny. It had it had um, intimations of providence or of the gods coming and and, inter and, and intervening, let's say, in our world. Um, but today we use it to mean things that make no sense, things in a sense that have no uh, discernible purpose, or it's just, or sometimes things that seem to point to powers that we didn't think existed. For example, if we experience a really meaningful synchronicity, like a crazy coincidence, coincidence, we'll say, oh, that was weird, but we don't mean it in the way that the old, the ancient Anglo-Saxons would have meant it, which was that's the gods coming in and telling us something. We mean it like, well, we have no explanation for this. That's really weird. And it makes me feel very uncomfortable. So the, the phenomenon of the weird to me, as it is, as it exists in, in modern times is, uh, a sign to me that we we really haven't settled everything when it comes to figuring out our place in this universe and um it it points to the limits of our modern construal it points to the edge zone where we don't really know what's going on and that's precisely where we encounter that mystery again right and Jacob, now you are taking a class. Is that how this is working? I, so I, I took uh, JF's uh, art and contemplation class over the summer, and I actually just signed up for a, a new class that he has coming up called Weird Religion, um, which I'm cool. looking forward to. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, and and I, I one of the one of the things that I really loved in that class was was how you outlined um, kind of partially using Buber's notion of I thou, um, just the important way that art um, it 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 helps facilitate this individuation process, um, and you and you specifically in your book contrast individualism with individuation. Um, mm -hmm. And, and in the, that kind of need to view things in life uh, from this Tao perspective where rather than reducing things to just the simple ways that we can explain them, art can, can really celebrate a specific relationship that we have with the world around us in, in a way that it it defines it, but also opens it up and, and acknowledges that it's it's something weird, something that we can't fully grasp in a kind right. of quantitative way. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and, and and the I thou uh, bit that's that yeah that was like that's not something that I um I wrote very much about in the book. It's something that's been growing on me since then. Um, but it seems to me that that all art by definition um, seems to call us to an I thou relationship with the world. When El Greco paints a stormy sky above Toledo in Spain, the clouds are not just clouds anymore. Those storm clouds are a kind of thou, a kind of divine intelligence, something that means, something that signifies, but also that means to, that, that, that intends something. Uh, when Van Gogh paints sunflowers, he's not doing what uh, a, a botanist would do, uh, drawing a diagram of sunflowers. He's calling attention to spe a specific set of sunflowers, which look back at him even as he gazes at, at them. And so there's this, uh, it seems to me that to, to call us back to mystery is always to call us back to a kind of primal I thou, which we all kind of I would say we all feel deep down when we look out at the world, at others around us, at nature, at the universe. It never manifests itself immediately as just a mere it or a, a bunch of its. It always comes to us as a kind of thou, a kind of presence, um, a kind of intention or intelligence. So uh, whether or not that's actually the case, um, uh, art seems to... Um, invite us to entertain that possibility um, and and in so doing reminds us of the fact that we know a lot less than we than we think we do when it comes to uh, our place in this in, in creation right 
One of the things that I find fascinating is, is your argument or contention that um, art is essentially timeless. I mean, uh, the other day when I talked about this, I showed some of the, the cave paintings, and you know, the amazing thing about those is they just hit you in the face. It's, it's, it, it's, just, it's completely timeless. We know exactly what's going on. So uh, what is it about art that, that achieves that, do you think? How does that happen? Well, well that's, that's the great mystery. And, you know, um, Phil and I are constantly trying to investigate that weird uh, truth that is that I think it's a truth that that um, it's like Picasso. You know, this is apocryphal, but supposedly Picasso went to check out the caves of Lascaux in France. And he when he came out, he said they invented everything. Basically, um, the very, very first artists had already figured out. You know what? art can do and had uh, found the techniques they needed to, um, to convey uh, the mystery through the aesthetic. Um, it seems to have appeared suddenly. Um, even archaeologists, uh, paleontologists will often um, wax almost in a kind of religious language when it comes to the sudden emergence or explosion of art onto the human scene. Um, how do we explain that? Well, this is where, you know, um, a, a purely rational science will fail us, perhaps, because it's very hard to imagine how uh, we might be able to leap into this mode that we, as, as, as beautiful as the constructions of various types of animals are, and as aesthetically pleasing as they are, there seems to be a kind of fundamental difference between, uh, like, uh, um, what animals do and what humans do. Um, and that's a very difficult chasm to bridge uh, empirically. Um, so my tendency is to think of it in terms of something more religious. Um, when John writes about Logos at the beginning of, of uh, the fourth gospel, to me, it's pointing us to something like a kind of cosmic uh, mind that manifests through humans. So, and you could equate that with what the Chinese sages called the Tao. Um, it's not causal, so it can't find its causes in history or in prehistory. It's somehow timeless. And art, for me, is a kind of sign uh, pointing us back to that, to that strange power that um, for some reason, um, chose to manifest through human beings uh, for better and for worse is, you know, when, when you bring in the logos, you bring in the capacity for evil, you know, you don't prosecute a killer whale for eating a seal. Um, but in human society, the moral horizon arises for me at the same time as the aesthetic horizon does. So the fall we could say is also the promise of, some kind of return to the mystery or some kind of union with it, perhaps. I don't know. Well, you know, uh, by the way, everybody, in our um, chat, we, we do have some links so that you can read some things by JF out there, get a hold of his book and uh, find some essays and the podcast, obviously, because they're really really cool. Um, I was reading this morning, um, and you know, uh, here we are in a religious or post-religious institution uh, here, and so I was reading about uh, your reflections on Nietzsche uh, and the death of God and the discovery of the planet Pluto, which you make some really cool um, uh, connections. Uh, of course, this is happening in the early 1930s when, when the world is really falling into fascism. And by golly, you know, we may be looking at that horizon once more. And, and you quote uh, the British uh, novelist uh, D.H. Lawrence, we've got to live no matter how many skies have fallen. And that really struck me that, number one, that D.H. Lawrence was looking at that, but also that you were Reflecting on that, um, can, can you say something about that? We, we've got to live no matter how many skies have fallen. Wow. Um, that's a big, okay. So it seems to me that, I, like, I agree with the view that 
modernity to a certain extent was a taking heaven by storm kind of affair. Um, it's not for no reason that um, people like Copernicus and Galileo were uh, were treated with fear and, and apprehension because the, the people of the time, the educated classes, basically the clergy, could feel that something big was coming, a big change that would mean a total upheaval. And modernity is that upheaval. Um, we have uh, crossed a threshold. And Nietzsche was, I would, I'd, I'd say, a, a prophet of that. Um, he wrote brilliantly about the consequences of all those skies falling of the great chain of being coming undone and all that. And so in that essay, I was trying to frame the discovery of Pluto as a kind of synchronistic uh, event in the story of our coming to terms with that, uh, that, that those, those falling skies, that, that realization. Um, however, to me, that whole chapter the doubt that Nietzsche radicalized and absolutized is part of something bigger, a process that is who, a process whose final endpoint we can't know. Um, but I think it's it's too hasty to think that Nietzsche kind of nailed the coffin when it comes to religion. I think that there's a lot more going on in the universe. And I think it's it, it, to say that God is dead is also strangely an affirmation of God in a weird way. And I don't know how I could untangle that weirdness uh, without taking up the rest of our time. But um, I think that facing the problem of modernity squarely in the face is part of what we're going to do next month in this new class. Um, we're going to be asking some hard questions about the modern, but also about the religious and about how we can somehow uh, find a way through what all too often manifests as a kind of abyss yawning under us right now, uh, an abyss of meaning, an abyss of truth, of, 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 of value. Um, I do think we need to think our way and perhaps um, you know, uh, feel our way create uh, you know like uh create our way out of out, out of this um this strange time we're in so i don't know if that, that makes any sense, sense but it's weird <laughs> it's weird <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah that kind of uh kind of connecting to one of the things you said in the class that i just really reframed art and religion uh, for me it was you saying that that uh uh, religion is art, um, and and it it also kind of calls to mind um, maybe the uses of art slash religion. Um, you, in one in one of your recent episodes, you talked about the work of John Carpenter, which was great. Uh, I love John Carpenter, um, <laughs> and uh, I I forget the exact quote, but you I, I think it was that episode where you said something along the lines of we have to damn ourselves in art in order to save ourselves in reality. And um, yes. I wonder, you know, the way that art and religion work in tandem, you know, things like revelations in the Bible, like the, and the necessity of, of, you know, work like John Carpenter's, which, you know, he has many pieces that kind of are, seem to be meditating on a re revelations kind of vision of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it seems to me that the perfect polity, the perfect kind of social situation for the artist is one of absolute freedom. Not because it's important that everybody gets to, to, um, uh, to express their opinion, but because it's in the spirit of absolute freedom, it's in that zone that you make real discoveries as an artist. And so, and, and the reason we should want artists to feel this freedom to express, to go into the darkest places and the most beautiful and sublime places, to be able to have, to, to, the reason we should celebrate artists, for example, like William Burroughs, who went to some very dark places indeed in his, in his literary work. The reason is because we can learn from what they find there. 
Um, art shows us the best in humans, but it also shows us the worst. Um, it must show us both sides. Uh, the strange irony is that art is, insofar as it's an aesthetic thing, it's amoral in that sense. It can go anywhere. It can, you can have like really dark black metal, you know, from like Eastern Europe that kind of freaks us out, but also awakens us to its opposite or to, uh, to, what, it's, to what it's negating or to what it's weirdly affirming. Um, we need to be able to accept that we have this zone, this, 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 this forum we've created called art, where people express themselves, because by doing so, we get to learn who we are, what forces inhabit us, what drives us. And um, sometimes I'm, I'm afraid, um, because it seems to me like today, it's harder and harder for artists to feel uh, that they have that freedom for various sociopolitical reasons. And I think it's something we should really try to preserve and protect because, um, you know, it's, I'll go back to William Burroughs. Uh, his, he called his book Naked Lunch and the, it was Jack Kerouac who suggested the title. And the word, uh, the term Naked Lunch uh, signifies the moment, the moment where reality freezes and you get to see what's at the end of every fork at like the feast, you know? And so you, in, in, in unflinchingly expressing that vision, Burroughs allows us to see the forces at work in, in, in our world and in ourselves, especially. So that when, when art can be done in that spirit, I think it can, it can be revelatory. It can occasion revelation. And it does extend and um, continue the tradition of, of prophecy in the modern world. teacher and I should mention that's probably why I can't write fiction anymore is because uh, William Burroughs is just um, you know he I think he he went to a place that most of us can't go and uh, so uh, and of course that's that's the beauty of Burroughs and his work um, we're, we're almost out of time just got a couple of minutes but I did want to ask you about what you call the assault on interiority uh, you know, uh, right. you make a difference, differentiation between art and artifice, and then you say we are living in an assault on interiority. So let's let's conclude with that. What you, what you... Sure. Okay. Um, well, no, everybody knows we live in a hyper mediated uh, technological society where we are um, continuous, continuously um, incited to. Uh, to, to, to externalize our, ourselves through social media, um, through various communications technologies and all that. So um, it goes deeper than that, but I think that's probably the easiest way to see how the interior is being exterior, exteriorized, externalized today. And that it's getting harder and harder in our uh, very hyper busy age to cultivate interiority. Um, it's harder and harder to read books, to meditate, to take walks without uh, earphones, um, to, uh, to cultivate the inner garden, and to thereby um, um, engage in what you know, Jacob was talking about earlier, individuation, developing uh, what James Hillman, the great psychologist James, James Hillman called soul making, to make yourself a soul. Um, and I think that this assault has obvious political advantages to certain groups, obviously, or certain, I don't, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, to certain um, interests, let's say, um, in society. Um, and I think it's important that we fight against that urge to exist in a purely externalized way through our social media networks and all that, but rather that we occasionally return to that inner solitude, that lonely place within us where we can uh, find visions that are unprecedented, things that no one has thought because no one like you has existed so far, things that are uh, not possible to label and to categorize. Um, and, to, to, and art, I think, again, a practice of art, a practice not of creating art, 
only, but of reading, watching, listening, um, can encourage us to build that interior garden where we can rediscover our own uh, singularity. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this has been great. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have in the chat, I believe, all of the, the various links. And then another, if, if you're interested in checking out this class that he's teaching, uh, it's called Weird Religion. You can go to uh, neurolearning.com, N-U-R-A learning.com, um, and we'll put that in the chat too. Um, and then one last thing I'll say, that the, the songs that I performed, that I made videos for, are all songs that they've talked about on their podcast, Lilac Wine, um, and then the one we will have after the Strawberry Fields Forever. Um, so check out the podcast and their takes on these songs. They're very excellent. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's, this has been great. Thanks. Thank you, J thank you, Jacob. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure to be here. Let me take you down Cause I'm going to Strawberry fields Nothing is real And nothing to get hung about Strawberry fields forever Misunderstanding all you see It's getting hard to be someone But it all works out It doesn't matter much to me Let me take you down Cause I'm going to Strawberry Nothing is real And nothing to get hung about Strawberry fields forever No one I think is in my dream I mean it must be high or low that is, you can't, you know, tune in, but it's all right. That is, I think it's not too bad. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to Strawberry Fields. Nothing is Nothing to get hung about Strawberry fields forever Always know Sometimes think it's me But you know I know when it's a dream I think no I mean a yes but it's all wrong that is, I think I disagree Let me take you down Cause I'm going to Strawberry field Nothing is real And nothing to get hung about
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. All of these we carry in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jacob, for the music and the art and for introducing us to JF. Thanks to JF. Definitely join us uh, for our online coffee hour, firstunitarian.org slash coffee hyphen hour, right after this. And thanks for joining us today, and thanks to our tech folk for making this happen. Our closing words are by Maya Angelou from her poem, Continue. My wish for you is that you continue. Continue to be who and how you are, to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue to dare to love deeply and risk everything for the good thing. Continue to float happily in the sea of infinite substance, which set aside riches for you before you even had a name. Continue. So may it be.